Hi, everyone. If you're just joining us, uh, thank you for being with us this evening or this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, we're going to get started in just a few minutes and give folks some more time to arrive. Thanks for your patience. Good afternoon and evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we'll be starting in just a few minutes. We're going to give uh, people a few more minutes to join us. Thanks. Good afternoon, uh, morning or evening, everyone, uh, wherever you're coming from. Thank you for your patience. We're going to give folks just another minute to uh, arrive on Zoom or YouTube, um, and we'll be starting shortly.
Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us here this evening, evening for us here in Amman. Uh, please note first and foremost that this lecture is being recorded and currently broadcast live on YouTube. So at the portion at the end, when we take some questions, please keep that in mind. My name is Pierce Paul Kreisman. It's my pleasure to be the director of ACOR. Uh, as you'll see here, the American Center of Research. We are in the throes of updating our name and thank you for, uh, for joining us today for what is certain to be a wonderful talk. Before we begin, just a couple of announcements as usual. It's nearly fellowship season. Uh, our fellowship applications will be available in, next month in September with, the, with them due by February 1st. We have a host of things available every year. Um, we're excited to receive applications for such. We have general fellowships for travel, research, and accommodation. We have fellowships for Jordanians and Jordanian students. Support for our past fellow, fellowship recipients to go to conferences and National Endowment for Humanities and KORC otherwise support. So please look into those when they become available. You can always receive the most current information at acorjordan.org. Before we get ourselves underway, we just want to let you know what our next lecture will be. Next month in September, we'll have a, another talk about the exceptional Roman era tomb at Beit Ross here in Jordan, uh, managed and essentially uh, uh, well-managed by our team at SHEP, the Sustainable Cultural Heritage through Engagement of Local Communities Project. It's a, a large consortium with many international partners and we're excited to bring that to you. But before we do, We're very excited and humbled to have one of our board members here with us tonight, Professor Betty Anderson. Now, again, please note that we'll hope to take a few audience questions at the end. You can submit these questions through the comments section here anytime in Zoom in the Q&A box or through the comments section in YouTube, which we are monitoring. For those in Zoom who want to ask your question in person, please just put your hand up. And at the end of the talk, we'll call on a number of folks as we have time available. Now, without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Betty Anderson. She's a professor of Middle East history at Boston University, and among her many published works are Nationalist Voices in Jordan, The Street and the State, and A History of the Modern Middle East. Professor Anderson, over to you. Thank you again. Uh, thank you very much. I'm gonna set up my PowerPoint when this one comes down. Okay, does the PowerPoint show, show up? Can someone let me know? Yes, it does. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, I wanna point out that I was on sabbatical last year, so I didn't have to figure out how to do an online lecture. So this is my first time, so bear with me while I try and figure out this technology. Hopefully this will all work and I can, it can make sense. Uh, I wanna thank ACOR for having this because this has been a wonderful experience for me to come through and think about the data in ways that I can present it and where, where they can uh, be fruitfully explained to the listeners. Okay, so what I wanna do is do a couple of introductions first. So as you see from the uh, notice here, this project is in collaboration with Dr. Fida Daly. So Fida and I met in Amman in 1993. And we have been friends ever since. We had Fulbrights at that time. We learned the city at that time. We walked around the city and, and got to know each other as well as the city at the exact same time. We've both written about Jordan. We both continue to return to Jordan all the time. So there was a moment in summer 2014 that we were staying together in Amman and we decided we wanted to do a project together and a project on Amman. And I, certainly for me, I had no idea what we were going to do at that given moment but it has evolved over time. And it has been just a wonderful collaboration because she's a brilliant anthropologist and she's brought that expertise into the project. And I've been able to learn from that. We have also over the years, starting in 2016 forward up until the present day have had a number of researchers 
And one of the best things I did in this project was hire a lot of brilliant and creative people to be around me. So this is the single most collaborative project I have ever been on. It is still collaborative. We are still not only collaborating on the data collection that we've just mostly completed, but then moving forward into the analysis phase, they, they're just so incredibly helpful to me and really bring out the, what I'm hoping are the experiences of Aman. And I'm gonna talk about some of these um, as I go through the talk today. So I wanna point out that for the last year from August until March, I had a Fulbright grant. So I was on the ground with the phase two researchers doing the research. Uh, we were, I was supposed to stay until the middle of June, of course, because of COVID had to leave in March. So I will bring up that a couple of times when we wanted to continue to do a project where we're not able to because I had to leave the country. And then obviously it became too dangerous to have in-person research. Uh, today, I'm not gonna give you any grand conclusions. Part of that is I, we still haven't even begun to really go through all the data that we have. But also I think there's part of looking at this city and thinking about the experiences of this city that we might not be coming up with some grand conclusions. So what I'm gonna talk about today are some methodologies, processes, and collaboration that have gone into the production of this project. And what's really become clear to me this summer as I've really started to dig into the data that we have, that from the very beginning, what we've been trying to do is collect the stories about people's experiences in the city where they feel most comfortable, where they feel uncomfortable, where their maps of the city are, where the black zones that they don't know about the city, how they define their place in the city. And I'm gonna go through and talk about how we were able to get that. But I think really it's about experiences that we've been focusing on. So Fida and I began in the summer of 2016, having the first phase one researchers go around and do observations of neighborhoods around town, like Abdoun Circle, Jebel Hussein, Rainbow Street, to talk about, to write and talk about who's there, how they're interacting. We also had a researcher mapping commercial streets around the city. Starting in 2017, Fida and I formulated the protocols for the project. And what we decided to do is start with focus groups and one-on-one -on -one interviews with 22 to 35 year olds living in representative neighbor, neighborhoods all over the city. Uh, we received informed consent for this from my university, Boston University. And we chose that particular group because we're really looking at the city as a whole. We're not looking at one particular neighborhood or two. We're looking really at the city as a whole. And so what we wanted to do is find a, a group in the city who experience the whole city because they're moving around for education, for jobs, the, the at different entertainment areas around the city that they would be able to tell us about the movement and the, their lives in disparate areas around the city. So in the summer of 2017, Fida and I actually stayed at ACOR and from there did the first focus groups. And from the very beginning, the researchers have always led the focus groups. The researchers have always done the interviews, we have not. And almost all of them are in Arabic. The only ones that are not in Arabic are the ones that chose to answer their questions in English. Otherwise, they're all in Arabic. Uh, that first summer of 2017, we organized a series of focus groups in locations in West Amman. And we invited people from all over the city to come. Uh, the only one we held outside West Amman was a very large one we held in a center in Marka. The second round, this last year, uh, we, had, we decided to move the focus groups to see if we could get different kinds of answers. So what we did is we held focus groups in Jebel Hussein, Nasser Camp, and Ashrafia. We were hoping to do more focus groups, but because of COVID, we could not do that. And what we did in both the focus groups and then the interview questions in both rounds is we asked people questions like, where do you feel comfortable or uncomfortable in the city? Where is your favorite place in the city and why? How do you move around the city? You know, what kind of conveyance? What are your experiences with the city in moving around? Uh, this last round, we very explicitly added new questions of what are your views of the Amman bus? What are your views of the rapid transit bus? Um, for anyone who knows Amman very well, you wouldn't be surprised that if we did a word cloud of the words that most commonly came up in the answers in the focus groups and in the interviews, traffic would be quite bold in the center 
because it is a difficult city to get around because of the traffic, because of the way the transportation nodes are worked out. When we moved to the interviews, we added more questions and we asked the, the interviewees about their education, about their jobs, about all the jobs they had had. And so we wanted to look more closely at the experience of the city of trying to get a job, moving around, networking. So we asked a lot more questions in the interviews. Um, we had every single one of our focus groups and interviewees fill out extensive surveys. And honestly, we haven't even begun to get to the wealth of data that is in those surveys, where we asked people all about all the neighborhoods they had ever lived in, how many times they think they go out per week, how much they spend go out on average, um, the educations of parents. We have a lot of data that is there that we filled out, which was wonderful. So I took a first stab at trying to analyze this data from the first round, the first round of focus groups and interviews, because um, I was giving papers at conferences like in Amman, um, to qualitatively look at the answers that we were getting. And so what I found qualitatively is the center of the Amman universe for our first round uh, respondents was Jebel Webde. And they talked about it really as an urban public space that flowed in a harmonious way. It's walkable. People that they were surrounded by were open-minded, laid back, multicultural. And so they really felt that Web Day had become that place that was truly the urban experience that they were looking for. The opposite of Web Day was Abdoom. So people said that the people around us have affectation. People in Abdoom are fake. I felt that they are strangers to me. So I presented that kind of data at um, conferences over the next year. And what people were doing is they were talking about the perception of um, how, how they fit within the other people who are around them. So here, I forgot that I was supposed to show this stuff. So let me just stop for a second that uh, we've interviewed 157 people total. You see it's evenly divided between men and women. Um, the age, average age of all the interviews was just short of 27 with women being just slightly older than the men that we have interviewed. You can see here this PowerPoint that we have in fact interviewed people from all over the city. This map is it's divided up by district with the most people from the Basman district then Abdali, then Wadi Seer districts. If you look here, this is a little bit different perception of this mapping. So what you have is you can see the darker blue is where more people and the kind of ex extension across the city. So going back, so sorry about that, going off uh, order a little bit. So I, in looking at a qualitative study, looked at how people were answering the questions where they felt comfortable and uncomfortable and their favorite places in the city. Fida and I have talked since the very beginning about any way we might be able to map or visualize our data. And we really didn't come up with a good answer for that because we didn't just want to map the data to map the data. We wanted to make sure that any data we did do that way would, have some, would be productive, would generate new kinds of questions. So here I have an example. Now I'm going to talk about collaboration. So Lubab, who's one of our current researchers, came up with a project called what she's calling emotion mapping. So what she has done is looked at not only the first round, but the second round. So she's combined all the 157 answers that we have, and she's quantified where people talked about the positive and negative experiences that they had had around the city. And so if you look to the left, you see the positive ones. So again, it's Web Day is the area that received the most positive responses, Jebel Ma next, and then downtown. The negative is Abdoon and the boulevard. So they go along with what I had found qualitatively. But at the same time, we're looking at these maps. And really, as we look at them, we can think of new questions to ask. So one of the issues that has come up since the very beginning is people always talked about locations in West Amman that hit in their heads. We never asked anybody, where, what do you like in West Amman? What do you like in East Amman? We just said, where do you feel comfortable or where your favorite location is? And people talked about these locations. 
But if you look at this map, it's not necessarily a West and East Amman map. As Razan, because we were analyzing this a few days ago, Razan, one of our researchers, was saying, no, in fact, there's really kind of a bubble inside West Amman, West Amman that has really garnered the attention of our respondents, where a lot of areas of the city are gray, that people aren't pinpointing these as places to discuss. So when I see a map like this, then I think what we are, what we are trying to do now, we haven't been able to finish this completely, is to think about how to layer on other kinds of maps that give other kinds of data to us. So for example, maps of where are their cafes, where are their restaurants, where are their hotels, where are their banks, where are their universities. So what we're hoping to do is to uh, have an interactive website that goes along with the book so people can in add the maps and layer the maps and see that a lot of the power brokers, the municipality, the state, investors have put a lot of money into places like WebDay, put a lot of money into places like Abdoon and the Boulevard. Some of that has returned as people talk about them as a comfortable place. Some of them, there's a negative reaction to that. So I think the, I'm really fascinated by these maps because they are making us think about the data in a new way. And I wouldn't have thought of that. So this, the collaboration is so wonderful that Lubab did think of that. And we can start to think about how we can analyze this enormous wealth of data that we have been able to collect. Here she's also taken the same data and just put it into a chart. And so we're looking at the data from a different way where men and when men and women said positive or negative things about a given area. And so what Lubab is gonna do next is gonna take about five locations and do a deep dive, add quantitative and qualitative data, see who the people are who said something positive. So for example, about downtown over here or those who said something negative about downtown. Um, going into the surveys, we had a number of people say that they really liked Medina Street as an area to go out in the evening. Well, go into the surveys and see how many of the people might have graduated from Jordan University. So we have a lot more work to do more about this data. But charting it and mapping it for me is a really productive exercise. Um, you also see I had her highlight camps, both positive and negative. And so we had, certainly in the first round, we had a lot of people say, oh, you know, in the camps, I don't feel comfortable in them. This round, we had a lot more people say, well, you know, I live in the camps, this is my life. I, you know, I can't imagine being anywhere else. It's my family, my networking, my volunteer organizations. So finding out the context by which people were talking about camps. So adding a qualitative analysis onto this. Um, East and West Amman, that came up a lot, that, you know, that perception of East and West Amman pursuing that even further. So another big, so that's a big part of our data, the focus groups and the interviews, and you know, just a continual wealth of data that we're gonna continue to pursue. The other thing, the other big methodology I wanna talk about is the walks that we took around the city. So here, here's the team near the very end, uh, I think it's Jebel Kasur, and what we did is we walked and we walked. We walked up staircases, we walked up mountains, we walked down mountains, we walked. And we walked all over the city. In some ways this goes, if you know Amman, goes against a little bit of what Amman is today. Amman is very much a driving city. It's hard to get from one mountain to another. Uh, we did the slow route. And as you can see, we stuck out. Certainly I stuck out. Certainly people want to know why I was wandering around these neighborhoods over and over again. Um, we had, people were gracious and kind, but I definitely got stares and questions as we were working around. When I got back to Boston in March, I talked to an anthropologist friend of mine and was enthusiastic about all these, these, this project that I'm talking about to you right now. And I talked about these walks and she said something that is, is really stuck with me since then. She said, that's wonderful. I, so she said me, I gave the researchers permission to be observant. And I would broaden that out to say, I also had to do that. So from the moment I arrived in August, every day I wrote an observation of where I, what I did that day and what, what struck me as interesting to write about. And then as we did these walks, wrote the observations. And then at some point, pretty early on, Fida said, well, all the team members should write observations. So we have enormous amounts of data of our own observations 
as we walk around the city. Um, as I said, enormous numbers of staircases, mountains. In the end, we covered a great deal of the city. As you can see, the shaded pink parts are just generally the neighborhoods we were in. The orange lines are the routes we took when we were on our own, taking walking around a particular neighborhood. And then the green lines are when we had a tour guide of some kind, so another, it might be an organized tour guide that, you know, we, that was a, a program that we went on or a tour guide that we asked to take us around his or her particular neighborhood. We started by going to neighborhoods that we ourselves were very, very familiar with. We went downtown, we went to Web Day and the researchers themselves had done earlier research so they could tell us the research they had done. So we recorded that and wrote those observations. Uh, we had an interesting experience going to Shmeisani because for me, I was the tour guide because in 1993, Shmeisani was the center of the entertainment universe, what Web Day is so much to so many people today. So I was able to tell a story of what Web uh, Shmeisani was like at that time. So then we decided we really to really have some conception of a neighborhood to get some experiences in the neighborhood besides our own, we then started asking people. And so a lot of our tour guides were young people within our range uh, or close to our range, a um, couple of older people. And we asked them to walk us around. So that's where a lot of the green line, all the green lines are. But we started with Hashimi Shimali, we went to Ashrafia, Jebel Nadif, Widat Camp, Haitha Faila, Wadi Ramam, Nasr Camp, Jebel Hussein, Nuzha, Dahyad Amir Hassan, Jebel Kusur, Marka, Mahatta. What we were doing on these locations is doing kind of a modified go along method. So the go along method has a number of permutations. And the go along method is the idea is you go along with a person during their daily route around an area, a city. You can photograph them, you can ask, you photograph the locations, you can ask questions of why they are going to this particular area, why they're um, um, choosing this particular route. Uh, we modified it a little bit because we actually asked questions. We, what we wanted is something of their knowledge of the history of the area. And, these are not professional historians. I, as a historian, didn't want a professional historian. I wanted the experiences of the neighborhood, wanted the way people described it. And when we had young people, they didn't necessarily know, they hadn't lived the history because they were so young, but they presented the common knowledge to us. And so they themselves also became particularly observant. And they often said to us, wow, I'd never really thought about it this way. And so, um, we had to, we got to have a nice engagement with our tour guides. Um, I want to do a shout out to Abdul Malik, who we engaged as a tour guide, and then he was so spectacular. We hired him on as a full member of the team. He has a truly encyclopedic knowledge of the city and was able to bring us from one neighbor to, to another, make connections, let us talk to people. So truly wonderful. He would have he has what I would call. Um, a horizontal view of the city. He really knows the breadth of this city. So on these tours, what people did is they showed us the hallmarks of their lives. They showed us their schools, they showed us the parks, they showed us their homes, they showed us um, the souks of the given area. They talked about their families moving in and out of this neighborhood. And we wrote that and, you know, got up onto the roofs of people's houses all the time. That um, we were, you know, shown this vista. This happens to be the uh, model, scale model of Amman that's at the municipality downtown at Russell Ein. Uh, they were constantly showing us the roofs, the vistas of the city. Um, they were bringing us into people's homes, older men's homes, so we could hear their stories about the city. So. Truly, we were collecting wonderful, really charming experiences all over the city. There are caveats, you know, and this, you know, we need to write about this. We need to acknowledge that there are caveats to this, that we were asking them to do something that was a little unnatural, that they weren't normally thinking of cohesive narratives of their communities. And we were asking them to be observant in ways that they normally are not. 
we also had this you know weird experience that we were in some ways being tourists in an area we were we were putting a different kind of value in these neighborhoods that are usually there unlike say downtown or web day that have lots of walking tours um, there were two moments actually on the same walk that really stuck out for me we were in Mahatta camp and just walking down the street and our guide was telling us something and a man just sitting outside his house said oh and this is my house so he wanted to point out that this is kind of crazy that you're walking through my neighborhood and and treating it in a different way than I would. A little while way later, we were maybe I think on the side of Jebel Nasser, heading towards Marka Junabia, and two women wanted to know what we were doing walking down the street. And we explained, and they were surprised. They said, "Oh, this isn't a nice neighborhood. What are you doing here?" And then promptly invited us over for coffee. Uh, we had to say no because we had to get. We had many more miles to go before sunset. So we were in some ways valuing the neighborhoods differently than the experiences of the people that we're going along with. Um, and, and you know, as amateur anthropologists at this point, we do have to be aware of our own positioning. And I, that's why I wanted to show you the picture of the team um, at the beginning, because we, our city did get bigger. Every one of us had black holes in the city that we'd just never been to or had not been to, to a, for a really long time. And hadn't, you know, for example, Jebel Hussein in 1993 was a really important place to go and walk and get kanafa. But I, in year, last years, I hadn't, been in, I hadn't been in a decade probably to Jebel Hussein when we walked there. So we, we had to think about who we were when we went before. Some of us might have worked in these neighborhoods and then we're now going in a different uh, capacity. Um, some people might have lived in the area, so had gone to the souk a lot with their parents, but hadn't gone in a long time. So we also had to be aware of that. Every time we sat down in a focus group, people always asked Fida and I, when Fida was there earlier, and then me over this last year, what are you doing here? And so we would explain our experiences from 1993 to the present. We had a really fabulous moment at the end of one of the focus groups this last round where the researcher who was in charge of facilitating asked all the questions. We went through that. This all takes a really long time to fill out the surveys and answer all the questions. And so the, at the end, the, the four or five people who stayed then quizzed the researchers. Well, who are you and why are you here? And how do you feel? What Do you feel comfortable or uncomfortable in this particular location? So it was a really interesting turning of the tables. And that, lad, that conversation went on for 30 or 45 minutes. And that's part of now the story of the experiences of a man. So by no means can we be neutral observers. We're part of this larger and growing experiences that we're collecting. Um, here are roofs. Um, Aisha hired on and I discovered when, I think I'm sure it was when we were walking in Jebel Nadif. So this is on a roof of Jebel Nadif. Someone, watching us walk by, invited us up to his roof, and she took this gorgeous photograph. And so from that point forward, seeing what a beautiful photographic eye she has, she became the team photographer. And so what we have are um, her documentation of our walk. So people go, you know, wherever we started from, she would document what the, the person was pointing out and what she would notice and what we would all notice. And she would take photographs of that. And so this is the same thing we have with the maps and the analysis, the visualizations is I think if we're gonna have a website because we know by no means can we have this in all these pictures in a book. And so what she's working on right now is organizing the photographs, not only by the walks, but by themes thinking, how can we think about this city by looking at photographs of something, staircases or buildings from around the city and for me, again, it's making sure that these are value added, that I have read way, way too many books about cities around the world that have photographs. And you think, oh, that's a street with three cars parked on it and a couple of people walking. It doesn't tell me anything. So what we need are the photographs to tell a value added story. And I'm hoping that will work out. There was a... a a logic to these tour trajectories as we started to go on more and more and we could see how this was playing out and this has to come into the analysis. Um, I think there's an intertwined phenomenon of Amman's topography and people's sense of place around the city. 
So Setane Shami, who may or may not be out there somewhere, has a really spectacular quote in one of her articles. And let me read it for a sec. The frequent steep turns and sudden drops offer unexpected glimpses and views of the city, juxtaposed in counterintuitive ways. This third dimension effect, plus the explosive growth of the city and the small downtown, which no longer provides a center, makes it difficult to orient oneself while navigating the city. One never knows which way one is facing. Even the more recent construction of high-rise buildings that serve as some sort of landmarks do not help as they suddenly appear from unexpected angles, adding to the puzzle as to which direction one is traveling. I really think that happens. And this is an, an image of Abed and Lubab on a roof in Jebel Kusur. And once our hostess invited us onto her roof, promptly handed us a map to help us get some conception of where we are. And I can say we all stood on those roofs and wondered where we were looking. And I know I personally all, you know, frequently just guessed wrong at whatever Jebel was across the way. And so I think there is something about the, the neighborhoods look in different ge geographical directions. I know for me, I have a really good sense of direction. A man throws me to know north, south, east, and west throws me every time I move around the city. And I haven't come for a long time, since 1993. Um, I, we did a walk in Dahid Amir Hassan and I could swear the whole time I was looking north and nope, I was looking west. So that, that's part of thinking about how these neighborhoods are connected by the road systems, by the valleys, by how people's perception of the, the area, the neighborhoods that they're closest to can be part of the analysis. Um, the rapid transit construction. And I just kept feeling like I would go down the street and suddenly there'd be a huge part of that construction project and wonder how it's all connected together. And I've seen maps of what the lines of the rapid transit system is. We'll have those eventually. Um, they make sense, but on the ground, it feels very, very disjointed. It's hard for me to tell where they might be connected. And so I think that's part of thinking about this very unique city of Amman with its topography, with its valleys, its mountains. Um, and how people move around given that. Um, we did, as I said, always go to the top of something. People were always inviting us up to the top. People, when we ourselves were just walking, we'd stop and see this picture on the left of you look between the buildings and you'd see in this case, part of the boulevard. Um, so I started joking at one point as we walked around that no matter where you are anywhere in the city, you can see the boulevard or the flagpole or pigeons. Um, from just a, a, a simplistic uh, analysis, the boulevard is about economic power. The flagpole is about state power. Pigeons might be opposition to power. Um, just totally by accident on this bridge over Istiklal Street, we found a place where you can actually see all three at the same time. It's not terribly clear here, but there's the flagpole over here. There's part of the boulevard and there's actually a flock of pigeons right here. Um, this is another layering of maps. It's coming back to what Satine was talking about. You can see the city from these landmarks. These are in the airspace. They, they stick out because they are different from so much of the built environment and the natural topography of the city. And this is very much about power. Maybe uh, pigeons, not so much, but the, the boulevard and the flagpole are very much about the, the power investment, the power brokers putting in uh, additions to the built environment. Um, as we walked around, um, we, we watched so many neighborhoods, we started overlapping. So we could see where this neighborhood met this one and this one. Um, so we were on, so much of what we're also gonna talk about is gonna be transportation nodes that how you get from one neighborhood to another in the city. Um, we kept bumping into Altaj Street because it's so long and it connects so many neighborhoods. Uh, every time we um, wanted to meet and go on a tour or go focus group, nine times out of 10, we met at Duar Dakhalia because when you, you start to think about where's a good place to bring everybody together to then go to a, a location, uh, Dwar Dekalia is a really good gateway between certainly West and East Amman. It's, it's what I swear is the worst traffic in the whole city. So difficult to get through Dwar Dekalia, 
but you can see what role it plays in this very large city. Uh, the same thing, the intersection at Ragadan Station with Istiklal, Jaish, and Yarmouk Streets. Um, so part of the project is going to um, the mapping these transportation nodes, how people are actually moving around. And we have a lot of data about how people get around. So of the 157 people that we interview. So as we were walking around these tours, Razan started talking about the fact that wherever we started tended to dictate the logic of the trajectory from that point forward. And I didn't ask tour guides to meet us anywhere specific. It was all up to them. I would agree to meet them anywhere they wanted to meet us. So for example, if we started at the top of a mountain, the walk downhill is a lot easier than the walk uphill would be. Uh, we did both. Um, but if we started at the top of the mountain, more than likely then you're doing history backwards because you're starting in the area that was developed uh, most recently and then heading down to the oldest section. Um, our very first tour in Hashim Ishmaili did that. We started at the Overlook at the top, a park up at the top, and worked our way all the way down to J Street. And what was interesting is our tour guide wanted to show us the house where he had been born. So he'd been born at the very bottom of the mountain. And so he was telling us his history backwards. Um, if we started in a Palestinian camp, the rest of the tour was more likely going to be about the Palestinian experience in that particular neighborhood. If we started at a volunteer organization, which we often did, volunteer uh, activities often became the framework for the particular talk. And then this is where I get to put my historian uh, cap on. So um, I kept seeing different origin, air, origin spots for the city that certainly we can think of 1878 and the settlement of what is now the modern city of Amman but we can also think about 1921, the Hashemite, um, the establishment of the Hashemite state, 1948, the arrival of the Palestinians. So what you get is different origin stories jutting out from those particular dates. We also kept hearing about events that had taken place in September, 1970. So people saw that as a hallmark of the mountain and then shooting from one mountain to another was often the story that we heard. Um, the 1980s and 1990s, when Amman spread well beyond the mythical Seven Hills out to the, the more far-flung neighborhoods in both East and West Amman. The wars in Iraq, the civil war in Syria, obviously this is an area, city that takes in a lot of refugees. They then put their mark on all of these neighborhoods and we kept hearing those stories as we walked around. The neoliberal development of the 21st century, that's the boulevard. That's the, the neighborhoods that people kept focusing on when we asked them where they feel comfortable and uncomfortable. So here we've got history, movement, topography, and now geopolitical events are key to thinking about this city and, and as a city at large and different questions about the, the city. So this summer, um, I wanted to just get something on paper, some kind of draft of a first chapter so that as I head into the chaos that is hybrid teaching in class next week, uh, when I know I won't be able to work on this project at all, I will at least have something on paper. And so what I did is I tapped into what I'm just talking about now and I wrote a chapter, what I'm calling chapter two, origin stories and ways of thinking about all these different dates as starting points for neighborhoods and the experiences that we had. And I detailed a lot of the walks that we went on, but to hone it down to what I was talking about is this kind of nexus of history, movement, um, um, topography, where I, I talked about how so much of the history of Amman is a vertical history. So starting at the bottom of the valley, moving up to the top, and then maybe even jumping to the next mountain as you, it becomes more fashionable. So people have more money to move to a newer neighborhood, but also you could see on the built environment of the city, the building up from a one story building to two and three and four stories that I saw a vertical history as well as an up and out. And it tapped into the experiences that we were recording that wherever we were, we were hearing about movement. We were hearing about, uh, people would say, oh, my family stays in, has stayed in the neighborhood, but so many people have moved out. It doesn't feel the same anymore. It doesn't it feel strange to us. 
uh, well, we're just about to move out, but we're going to hang on to this house and rent it out because sons and the family are going to get married and they're going to need a house. Um, we talked about families that, you know, once one member is here, one member is there. So movement was very often the conversation we were hearing in whether it's movement inside the house to build stories or to move around neighborhoods. So I wrote that and I sent it out to the team. So now what's become my role is to write the first draft of something and then have these brilliant creative people come in and say, oh, but wait a minute, why don't you do it this way? So let me just give you some examples of what some of the team members responded to this draft. So Mazin said, okay, you know, I like the idea of a vertical history, but it's only in some parts of the city. You know, we really need to think about the, particularly the 80s and 90s, moving out to a more horizontal view of the city because they're moving out to flatter areas, but moving out and spreading widely as opposed to up. He also pin, you know, went back to this idea of geopolitical events and you know, thinking of other uh, triggers for a neighborhood. So Suela and Jabeja, heavily influenced by the building of Jordan University, Marca by the airport and the military institutions around it, Ashrafia by Bashir Hospital, Abu Darwish Mosque, so there are many different ways, you know, so there's geography, but there's also institutional structures that are key to thinking about spread in the city. Um, Tarek came in and said, okay, I like this idea of um, vertical, but you know, a lot of people still have a horizontal view of the city, like Abdul Malik, but also, you know, he's reminding me, we tapping into why we went to 22 and 35 year olds, the focus groups and the interviews that show people moving around the city quite widely. Um, Lubab came in and talked about how I had left out too much of the social dimension and wanting to bring that back in and maybe thinking about Jordanian novels. And Fida coming in and saying, okay, but we still need to talk about power. This isn't individual agency completely. There's a lot of that, but the city has torn down neighborhoods, displaced people. A lot of people leave for the Gulf for better jobs. Um, UNRWA has rules about how you can build up, out. Um, I bring this up because this is, this is the phase where I'm in right now. Like I said, I'm, it's my job now to uh, put together the first draft of something so then we can have this conversation. And now I need to incorporate these ideas. Um, find a way to think about how we can write these disparate stories of Amman. And think about it as these disparate experiences in Amman. Collaboration is a method of thinking about a whole city from my perspective. Um, I'm now there, my researchers' jobs and the phase two researchers, their jobs right now are to write their own stories of Amman. So those will be interspersed into the text itself. So I think it's, going to be uh, not going to come up. I said at the very beginning, I'm not going to give you any grand conclusions right now. It's a lot of just ideas. But I think in a lot of ways, thinking about this large city, thinking about the um, our experiences and the experiences we collected, I think it's going to be diverse. It's not going to come in and hone, I don't think, on a specific um, thesis. It's going to more look at methodologies and method and what methodologies can produce. So I thought I would just end with a pretty silly short video, tiny video, where we had done a very long walk and Nuzha and we'd gone past Istiqlal Mall and we needed to get down to Jordan Street and it was cold and we're very tired. The idea of turning back, again, this isn't a very Amman experience. We would have had to, we're at the edge of a mountain, we would have had to turn back and go all the way around to get back there. We couldn't do it, so we walked down this mountain. And some of us thought it was pretty steep and some of us laughed at everybody else. So I will just end very quickly with this short video. So thank you very much. And thank you. It's truly our pleasure. I can only assume that there's a rousing round of applause coming from everybody viewing uh, all over the world. Who knows? Uh, we do have a few questions if you're up for it. Sure. Okay. 
first is, uh, is submitted through, through Zoom here. Every district has a wide range of different household backgrounds. What assumptions are you taking into account while conducting your research? Um, what assumptions are we taking into account? Um, that is, so we did not collect that data this round. A lot of people have done that kind of data. So in moving forward, as for example, Lubab talked about wanting to put more social history in, I think we need more, we need to tap into the data that people have been collecting on that. And a lot of good research has been done on that. And I, I said, honestly, throughout this last research trip, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to reinvent what other people are doing. So thus far, we have not taken that into account very much, but that's something I, I would imagine we're gonna have to go forward and look, go back to the data that people have collected. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, almost somewhat of a series of questions. Do the interviews and focus groups ask how participants themselves would quote, position Amman in a regional or global network of cities? Yeah, I mean, they, they, it, not very often. We, it, they, they, they tend to talk more about the you know, internal to Amman. But there were times where people would say, oh, Amman isn't like Beirut or isn't like Cairo. It, it, doesn't, it isn't walkable. It doesn't have the cafe zones that you'd have in these other cities. It's not old. It doesn't have an old souk. Um, it would do that. Or a lot of people we interviewed grew up in Dubai or grew up in somewhere else and then moved back. So they'd have a little bit of a comparison. So some of that is there. Mostly people talked about their experiences. Part of it is our questions were asked that way but they were asking, um, uh, people were talking about Europe. They'd say, oh, you know, it's not like Europe where we can do this and this and we can go biking. So there was a certain comparison like that. And often it was what Aman doesn't have, but then we also, one of the, the very last question we ask in the interviews is, um, would you, do you vision, vision yourself staying here for, uh, would you vision yourself being here in 10 years? And then we also ask, what is Aman to you? And there we got a lot of answers. We'd love to stay in Amman. It's our family here, that, but it's, it's so hard. There are no jobs. I think I'm going to have to emigrate, go somewhere else. So in some ways, we, we got that answer that way too. So that leads right into the next question in that chain is, is there an Amman brand? Or it sounds like you're saying the brand is somewhat more of what's missing. Well, in some ways people in, in thinking of a man in a larger way, but at the same time, people, um, people have, you know, it's a, kind of the questions we answered, you know, we asked, what is a man to you? What, um, what, do, what does it mean to you is kind of what we were asking. And so people were doing it from a more personal perspective and less from the brand. Lots of complaints about the municipality, lots of complaints about the state. We got that kind of thing. But mostly I would say people were talking about their, their own personal connection, not so much a brand, although complaints about it not being the urban experience that they had experienced somewhere else around the world. Mm -hmm. We have two more questions for you if you're up for it. Sure. Did you see anything or will you address the geography of non-citizens of different classes and racial or national backgrounds? Um, that's another thing that we didn't necessarily have to do that. We did interview a few non-citizens and they talked about how hard it was because they didn't have an ID and couldn't get a job. So we have some of their experiences in this batch of people that we talked to. Um, but that's also, people have mapped that. So we can, those are just an overlay of maps that we can get. Okay, and then I think we'll close out with one more. Do you think that there's an influence of the Western culture on the positive or negative reviews from the interviewees? Yeah, I, that, that there was definitely a conversation of what, what a city should be, that it should be walkable, it should be, you know, bikeable, that you should be able to go to nice areas and be able to interact in social settings. People were definitely, you know, they wanted, you know, some idea of mass transit. There was... Uh, more green space. People talked about what was missing in Amman. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and so they had, so from a Western, they had kind of a perception, you know, they were kind of taking it from a perception of this is what a city should be. Why isn't Amman like our perception, what we think a city should be? 
Thank you very much for that. There are more questions rolling in, rolling in, and if we took them all, we'd be here all night. Um, yeah. After we wrap up things, you can click on the Q&A, and if okay. you want to stay on and, and engage with folks more, we can leave the, the chat open for a little while. Okay. Um, I did want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, if you uh, are interested in these sorts of things in the next day or so, we will send out an email as a follow-up uh, to everyone who registered with a link to the recorded talk so you can go back and look at these things and, and catch up on it and maybe uh, send Professor Anderson some questions directly. Um, and also sign up for updates from us so you can be the first to know about future events. Uh, most of them I expect will be digital for the foreseeable future, but one day, possibly maybe one day, we'll even do things in person again. Uh, so if everybody will thank my, uh, will join me in, in, in thanking Betty very much for this talk, uh, we will stop the recording here shortly. And for those on YouTube, uh, thank you for joining us as well. All right, thank you very much.